Good morning, everyone. We have been talking over the last three weeks a little bit about the Holy Spirit and hope we have been encouraging you to engage again with an open mind and certainly with a willingness to experience that which is not new for the church and certainly not to be feared or to, or to be stayed away from, but an understanding of God as he has revealed or as God has revealed God's self to us through uh, himself as Father, as Son, and Spirit. As we've talked about the Holy Spirit, we have done the first week um, a conversation around the promise of the Holy Spirit. In that week when we spoke about it, we said some things around the fact that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament operated in a specific way. He came upon special people at special times to accomplish spe special tasks and as such was not um, as available inside the believer as he was coming from outside. So he, as a promise was given, the promise was that there was going to be a spirit, the spirit was coming who would now reside in the hearts of people, transforming the relationship between God and human beings from simply a relationship of do's and don'ts, of, of laws that regulate behavior, to a relationship of connection, reestablishing what God set out in the very beginning when he breathed into human beings the breath of life and human beings became a living soul. So now the promise was that the spirit would be available to all, all people at all times and in all situations of their lives. The purpose for that, the purpose of the coming of the spirit we said was that the spirit of God would help us to live a life that is worthy of being God's children, the God life, so that what God intended at creation for us, he's now giving us the ability to live out. Uh, having gone through the fall, having experienced all of that, he is now promising the spirit. So that was the first week. The second week, last week, I am going to just kind of pull together what, what, what's a sense of what we talked about or what, what comes with this idea of, of the coming of the Holy Spirit. That the coming of the Holy Spirit is really the fulfillment of God's promise. God said, in the last days, I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh and all people, young men, old, um, young women, old men, old women, on slaves and, and free. All people are going to have this opportunity to experience the connection to God in a new way so that he promises the, the pouring out of his spirit in this new order. And, and, and this was therefore going to be for those who believe, all of those who believe, not just for people who are endured at a particular time to experience a particular um, activity or, or task, or, but, but for all people who believe. And that spirit would become a mark or a seal on the person to demonstrate the belonging that you are now belonging to Christ. The purpose of that when Jesus spoke to the disciples just ahead of his ascension, he said, I am going into, I'm going away and, and the Holy Spirit is going to come. And when he comes, he is going to help you in ways that you might become witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all, all the utmost parts of the earth. That there is going to be a purpose for the coming of God's Spirit in our lives. That to help us to be witnesses to God, the good news. So that we, by the Spirit coming into us, living in our lives, help us to bear testimony to who God is. So that was the promise, that was the coming. Today we're talking about the indwelling. So we're talking about God taking up God's permanent residence in our lives. So the believer, when the spirit lives inside, is a believer who has God's at residence or living in residence in their lives on a continual um, continuous basis and that means something for uh, for us Jesus himself speaking about the spirit was coming to his disciples he said that spirit the part in red he lives with you and he will be in you because what we said last couple of times is that if we do not have the spirit of God in us then we don't it's okay if you don't have the spirit of God you do not belong Romans tells us that you don't belong to Christ so that part of the, 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 the way that you know you belong to Christ is that the Spirit resides in you. And part of the way you know the Spirit 
um, resides in you is that you belong to Christ. So that it, it is, it, it, that's the, the transaction of the relationship. Help me, brother. Whenever you see me click on I don't make it, just help me. It is a progression, and the progression is described in the Bible in a way that, uh, that, that, that helps us to understand what God's intention was. That, that, that he started out, when God, when he, he lived among people, in a, in a structure that was a, a temporary structure called the tabernacle. Anybody knows what the tabernacle was, was like? Do you know what? Anybody can tell me what the tabernacle was like? It was a tent. Yeah, a collapsible building that God uh, gave them the specifications to make and told them, as you are walking as nomads um, through the wilderness, looking for this promised land, you come to a certain place and you camp. When you put your tents down, you put this tent in the middle, and that's going to represent my presence among you. And not only was the, the tabernacle there, was, there was also a, a, a light that lived in that tabernacle, which was a Shekinah, the glory of God. And that was a demonstration to people that God was here. And in fact, sometimes the light wasn't there. The light departed from out of the, the camp. It means that God wasn't quite pleased with what was happening and he just left. So God is moving them from an understanding of a temporary structure of tabernacle. When they got into the promised land, they were given instructions to build a temple. More permanent, a more permanent building. And God was in that also helping them to understand that they were moving in their relationship from understanding God to be resident in institution to being resident in personal relationship. So that whereas God had given the commands written on tablets of stone, remember we talked about that in the first week, he wrote the covenant on stones, he is now transitioning that into writing it on their hearts. So that he gave them the, the tabernacle and the temple as a way of helping them to understand how to live out the life that he intended for them. He says, no, I am putting it in your hearts. So that you don't need priests and other people to interpret and figure it out for you. You don't need to be told all these minutia of laws, how to behave. But you are now going to have that law written on your hearts. There's going to be a connection. And did we talk about connection the first week we did? We talked about the fact that God breathed into human beings the breath of life and humans became a living soul as a result of that the connection that god established which was broken by the fall corrupted by sin in us and except for you perfect people it is always present in us imperfect ones that 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 needed to be restored and by this relationship the holy spirit comes and helps to do that so he's moving away from an occasional action of God in the lives of people coming every now and again and then leaving at a certain point and maintaining a permanent presence in our lives. With me so far? Still on board? Nobody's sleeping just yet? It's not your sleeping time. The idea, we talked about a tent, about the tabernacle being a tent, of God's spirit living or dwelling among us really is taken from that old tabernacle language. God told people that whenever they, pit, they made up their camp, they should pitch the tent. And in that tent, that tabernacle is that where God was going to dwell. So you now hear the words and people say, boy, I'm going to tabernacle with you. It means the idea carried over of a pitching of tent. When somebody pitches their tent, what, does it, what did it signal in that time? That we're stopping here for a while. We're going to stay here. So that the pitching of tent, which is the idea from again from the tabernacle, then moved up to the um, temple. But then, when it came to the New Testament, it came in the, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Remember that verse in John chapter 1, verse 14 for us? The word, read it with me, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So that what God intended in the relationship he was establishing with people that his presence would be them in the tabernacle and then more permanently in the temple becomes even more permanent but real and personal in the Christ who incarnated, who took on flesh, who embodied flesh so that he might dwell among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. It demonstrates God's intention that God wants to have that connection with human beings. He wants to have this relationship of abiding, of dwelling. 
And so when the Holy Spirit is offered to us, when he comes to us, he becomes the kind of traveling partner. Paraclete is the word that is used, which, is really mean, which really means a walk alongside her. Walks beside me. Somebody who is my companion. Anybody who likes to travel, likes to travel alone, or you like to travel with people? Depends on your personality. There's no right or wrong answer. Don't look at me like, uh, should I really answer this one? Some of you like to travel alone, but some of you like to travel with somebody else because you like to be able to have somebody to share the experience with. The good days, the not so good days, the, the joys of the travel and certainly the frustrations of it. It's certainly good when you go to somewhere completely different that you're not the only one like you, that you have somebody else who at least you know and who you can exchange notes with. The Holy Spirit becomes that permanent presence of God in our lives in the way that a traveling partner is. So if you're with me still, you're hearing us say that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is about God's commitment to living permanently in our lives, to making available to us for every moment, for every day, for every experience, for every decision, for every situation, an ability to engage that experience, moment, decision, uh, 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 space of our lives, to engage it in a God-like way. For you know what the Bible knows about us? You know what God knows about us? At the heart of man is what? You don't know that verse, do you? That's a verse you mustn't um, know very well. The heart of man is deceitful and desperate, the wicked above all things, who can imagine it? The Bible and God knows that human beings, if we are left on our own, we don't go God's way. That's not the natural thing for us. In fact, the natural thing for us to do is to do our own stuff. You know why Jesus, when he was making a lot of his sermons, he talked about, it was said what I say, it was said what I say. One of them, he said, it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. How many of you think that's a good rule? No? It probably is a good rule based on what was happening. Because what was happening when that rule came around was that when somebody stuck somebody else in the eye, that person got so mad they pull out their machete and they chop off the head. And they say, no, 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 not like that, not like that. You can only exact from the other person what they took from you. That's a principle, eh? So that's, the, that's what he established. So God said, hey, all right, you know something? If we leave these people of themselves, we won't have anybody to deal with after a while. So let's regulate their behavior. Old covenant, remember? Old covenant. So I for an eye to you, Jesus says, but I say to you, what? Turn the other cheek. Which of us, for, whom, for, for which of us does turning the other cheek come readily? All right, you can, yeah, you can say me. Yeah, I'm, I'm good like that, but, but, but not many of us, not many of us. It, it goes so counter to how we are made up, for we are about seeking to ensure that our rights are not violated, that, our, that, our, that someone doesn't cross over our boundaries and, and, and impinge on our lines. And so he says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, I say, turn the other cheek. A mo mo signaling a transitioning of the Spirit of God dwelling in us. Then, he has to give us some rules to regulate. Now he gives us the Spirit. It is only when the Spirit of God takes hold of us that we can really turn the cheek. You know that? Oh, yeah. So let's make a distinction here. There's a distinction to be made here between um, the baptism which we talked about last week when the Holy Spirit came. And he came upon as a baptism is an initiator right by which we enter into the family of God. So there is that event of the baptism. But here we're talking about an indwelling, a living in us in a way that is like something that helps to create a state of being about us. So that if the Holy Spirit comes on at conversion, regenerates the human heart, takes away our unrighteousness or sinfulness and clothes us with the righteousness of God that happens then pours that out on us and we need that kind of full pouring over to to get it really saturated then he lives in us 
to maintain, to create a state of being about us that is towards Christ, oriented towards Christ, living a life towards the life of Christ. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So the purpose. If in the first week we said that the promise of the Holy Spirit was to give us an up, uh, uh, to, 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 to live, help us to live the God life, then the second week was about witnessing to the good news. Then this one really is about making sure that living the God life is possible. And the only way we can live the God life is when the image of Jesus Christ is formed in us. How do we know what God is like? Jesus said. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The only way we know what God expects is just by looking at Jesus. So it becomes the kind of example, you know, kind of the model from which we paint. And you sit there, you watch Jesus, watch how he interacted, watch what he did, watch how he made decisions. And that becomes the example for us so that the image of God lives in us. Or rather, the Spirit of God lives in us so that the image of Christ might emerge. So we may come more and more like Jesus. I want to be more and more like Jesus, right? And so it becomes more than a song. It becomes something about a real unveiling of ourselves and a recasting of that with the Spirit of God. So what are some results? <clears throat> results of the Holy Spirit living in our lives. One of them is regeneration. I think we talked a little bit about that before. But you know I'm going to ask you to read these texts, right? Because that's a way to make sure you keep awake. So read with me. Titus 3 verse 5. So that gives us a sense that the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit's work in regeneration. So that the Holy Spirit had a task. Not only did Jesus die for us, but the Spirit of God pulled us and caused us to appropriate what Jesus did. Because do you know that if the Spirit didn't call you, you couldn't respond to what Christ did for you? Yeah. The fact is that Christ would have done a great job and he'd be sitting over there in the corner and saying, Hey, why doesn't anybody know? But the Spirit's job is to pull us towards that. And to make us inclined to receive God's gift. The second one is belonging. Now, Romans, and there are about three slides of this one, and we're going to keep reading the verses. Let's go. You didn't receive a spirit that makes you a slave to fear once again. Instead, you received the Holy Spirit who makes you God's child. By the Spirit's power, we call God Abba. Abba means Father. The Spirit Himself joins with our spirits. Together they gave witness that we are the children. One more. As his children, we will receive all that he has for us. We will share what Christ receives. But we must share in his sufferings if we want to share in glory. We're part of because of the Spirit. We belong to God's family because of the Spirit who makes us what? He baptizes us into that family. You know, this is how uh, we bring our children um, and, 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 and baptize them, or we come and we are baptized uh, into the family of the particular congregation. Um, it is by the Spirit of God that we are brought into the family of God. And it is that Spirit at work in us that makes belonging possible. So the next one is placing. Similar to belonging, but it really speaks about the fact that it is God's Spirit who puts us into the, the midst of what is the body of Christ. So we are all baptized by one Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Do you know that you're part of God's people, part of God's church, not because of anything that you did or not because um, you, were the, you, know, you had gotten things right or you were, you were at the right stage of your life, but that God's Spirit took you and placed you within his family. Uh, we have a saying in Jamaica that says, uh, dishcloth turn tablecloth. There are, there's a distinction between dishcloth and tablecloth. The dishcloth is the one that you use in the kitchen. It's the dish rag. And that doesn't come on the main table. Certainly not when you're having guests. Tablecloth, and especially the nicer ones, are reserved for, for good company. And sometimes, you see, we come to the place 
of, of, of faith with an understanding that, that we come from different backgrounds with many different experiences and, 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 and things about our lives. Some of them are not always the most recommending or you know, newsworthy. Or, or those, okay. We come with whatever we have, with the messiness of our lives, but it is God's Spirit who takes us, whoever we are, with whatever struggles we have, and places us within the family. And so, that which does not have, initially at least, or certainly in the estimation of other people, upfront appearance, and should be relegated to the back, becomes something that is of value now because God has transformed that and elevated its use to something that is even spectacular, meaningful, more meaningful. So dishcloth can become tablecloth. There is a space for even the worst of us, even with the most uh, difficult or challenging or, or unsmoothed out pieces of our lives. And God calls us into relationship with himself. He places us into the family. So uh, you probably had kids because you and your um, significant other decided we're going to have a child. And whether you had one that was your, yours biologically or you adopted, you made some decisions about that. You don't get to choose who comes into this family. Sometimes we like to choose, wouldn't we? All right, you don't have to be honest right now. You... You can just smile like good Christians and say, you know, I'm thankful. But no, what we really mean, we would love to choose sometimes. I'd love to choose sometimes. Uh, but thank God I don't get to. And thank God he has given me a place within his body, within the body of Christ. All right, let me, let me move along and not harass you. At, 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 I think I went a little too fast. Go back up uh, right after placing. Sorry, next one down. Thanks. We're going to talk about this one in particular two weeks' time, so I'm not going to spend much time except to say all the gifts are produced by one and the same Spirit. He gives them to each person so that God has gifts that he gives to his church and he gives them for reasons. And we must understand that God controls the distribution of that. Hello? Yeah, he controls the distribution of that. So, so you don't get to, to talk about somebody else's. You just simply get to say, Lord, what is mine and how do I use it? Okay then, all right. But we'll talk about that come the, um, the, uh, the, um, the 19th, yes, with the giftings of it. So, so let's talk about nurturing. Nurturing. Part of the result of the indwelling of God's Spirit, God's Spirit living inside of us, is that he helps to uh, build us up. And one of the ways in which he does that is to help us to understand and apply Scripture. I don't know if you've ever had, had the experience of someone who, who, who say, I don't understand the scriptures, or I find Bible reading boring, or I, I don't get anything out of it. It has a lot to do with the fact that what we said earlier about our, our human desires, interests, and so on, not naturally aligning with that of God. And in order for God's word to come alive in anybody's spirit, the Holy Spirit has to take that word and to, to do something with our hearts to receive it. It is only as God's spirit has had control of my life. And I want to say it in a way, not to suggest that it happened some long time ago and now it, it, it doesn't happen anymore, where I, I used to um, feel that the word was boring and so on, and now it doesn't anymore. The truth is that it depends on the point of life, the stage of my life, or, or what's happening in the circumstances of my life. Sometimes I lose an interest in God's word. It's not, it doesn't come alive. It's not as meaningful because perhaps I'm not as open to God's spirit. I'm not as yielded to God's spirit for that word to come alive. But the moments, those times when I, when I say, God, you know, speak to me. When I open myself to that, his word becomes what the writer of the psalm says, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Anytime you start to say, I can't take this place because they, the, the sermons are boring or that nobody preaches, they're not ministering to me, it probably has more to do with you than it has to do with the preacher. Yeah, it might have something to do with the preacher, yeah, I know. But it probably has something more to do with you. 
1 Corinthians 2 says, we have not received this, the spirit of the world. We have received the spirit who is from God. The spirit helps us to understand what God has freely given to us. So if you're having a problem understanding the word of God, pray. Lord, cause your Holy Spirit to take my mind. Help me to understand. Read it in another version on Swan 2. Yes, you know. Ask some people to talk about it. That helps too. But I'm saying, open yourself to the Spirit of God for that. The other part of the nurturing has to do with our prayer. Not only our reading of the scriptures, but our prayers. And the Holy Spirit's indwelling, our, indwelling in our lives enables us to, to have an enriched prayer fellowship with God. For we are connecting with God. Isn't that what prayer is? Prayer is communication. When, you, when are you closest or feel most, you know, um, in sync with your significant other? Isn't it when you're spending time with that person? Isn't it when you are, you're, you're, you're cleared up the, the little, the cobwebs of the things that are, that, that, that impinge the relationship and so on? Isn't it when you are kind of like spirit to spirit with that person? That's when you kind of feel connected. In the same way, the Holy Spirit helps to connect us to God in prayer. And not only does the Spirit help us to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is praying for you? Read with this, please. It says the Holy Spirit helps us when we are. Read along. We don't know what we should pray for. But the Spirit himself prays for us. He prays with groans too deep for words. There's another one. God who looks into our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. And the Spirit prays for God's people just as God wants him to pray. So the Holy Spirit is at work. That indwelling Spirit in nurturing us to prayer. Um, let's take this last one. It says empowerment. And this perhaps is the crux of really what the Holy Spirit living in our lives, indwelling our lives does. The Holy Spirit enables the believer to, ye to yield to Christ. You know what yielding is? What does yield mean? When you're on the road and you yield, what do you do? You submit. You allow someone else. You, you give way. That's the other word that's used for it in the science. Give way. Somehow, we have to learn how to give way. Galatians, Paul says to us, so I say, live by the Spirit's, the Holy Spirit's power. Then you will not do what your sinful nature wants to do. Anybody like me? Human? I've got a lot of sinful nature. A lot of intemperance and, and other things. That, that one is one of the, the nicer ones to speak about in public, actually. That I can talk about. There are many other things that I will not talk about here. I have, I have much. But, but, but the Holy Spirit's power. Anytime I, I try to make good on what I know I should do. So I say, you know, I know I shouldn't respond in this way. Or I know I shouldn't do that because I know right. I know the scriptures about that. I know that I've been, you know, in this thing for a long time or, you know, much more is expected of me and look at the position I hold or any of those things. And that becomes the way in which I approach my sinful nature. See me in an hour and I will be, oh my God, not again. I just did it again. Oops, I did it again. Whenever I submit to Christ and I recognize, hey, this is not going to take Donovan's strength for I really can't manage it. Some things I can manage, you know. They're not big deals. Like I can manage some things. Probably your sins I can manage, but I can't manage mine very well. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's power is what becomes the empowerment for me, enabling me to yield to Christ. So, as the Holy Spirit does that he produces fruit in me we're not going to talk about this now because next week that's what you're going to be talking about um, and the passage here just simply says hey fruit of the spirit produces love joy peace you know patience you know that one kindness and goodness faithful and gentle and having self-control that one is a a big one um, and there's no law against this kind of so all that empowerment is going to do well here's the big one and that is submission how many of you like to submit, to yield? I don't like it on the road, and that's only a small part. You notice where 
Paul uses the word submit, he uses it in a relationship between husband and wife. And we don't like that one very well, do we? Not at all. Ladies, I'm with you on this one. I wouldn't like it too much if you have to submit to some of us men, right? I mean, not me, the not so nice men. You know? Yeah, my wife isn't here. Um, but submission is hard because it is about giving up something of you and allowing the other person. And that can be difficult. But you realize in that very place where Paul says that wives must submit, he gives it in the context of a conversation that he has been having with the men before. He says, husbands, do what? Love your wives. How? You know how you know that part? Well, eh? As Christ loved the church, and there's another little line after that, and gave himself for her. Wow. Now, we can spend a few more minutes on this one, can't we? Ladies, you're okay to stay five more minutes in church if I, if I keep this one up? All right. <laughs> so, so he has that conversation with men. He says, love your wives in that kind of a way as Christ, willing to yield of himself. For there's another scripture that says that he didn't see equality with God, something to be grasped. But he made himself obedient to death, death on a cross. So if a husband were to love his wife in that way, wow, you would be up easy street. Because every decision, every action, every attitude, every move towards you or in your direction would be for your good. This man would be spending his time up at night till three in the morning trying to figure out, how can I love my wife? How can I please her? How can I serve her? How can I make... Honey, you, can, you don't have to come to bed. You stay up. Keep thinking about that. Huh? If that were the way, then when it comes to submitting, what would you do? Oh, sure, sure. Because everything you're going to do is going to be for my interest. You see how that works? Submit. We can submit to God because we know what Christ is like. We know how he is towards us. And that is why in the same relationship, by the way, and we don't, we drop the whole submit thing because we're afraid of it, forgetting that he did say, husbands and wives submit one to the other. Don't know that one? Okay, go find it. So, but submission here is a requirement of this relationship. Is there any reason why uh, that maybe many relationships don't last very long? Because of the struggle that it is to, to live in that kind of a way, to yield of yourself enough so that you live for the other person? In this relationship, it is important, paramount, ne necessary that we must submit. If we don't, here are two things that happen. We either grieve the Holy Spirit. Thanks for those words. Those are the words that uh, Reverend Yvette uh, was mentioning. You know, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. This is a King James word, by the way, grieving the Holy Spirit. In the newer translation, they talk about making the Holy Spirit sad. I like grieve. You know what grieving is? When you say to your child, let's do it this way. When you outline to them why this path is a good path to go, and why they must make these um, decisions and blah, 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 and you sit with them and you discuss and you work it through and, and you have buying and all of that kind of a thing and then you leave and they do the opposite. That's grief. It says do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And we grieve the Holy Spirit when we live sinfully, meaning according to our sinful nature. Grieving the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, like a parent, sits and he pulls out his hair and he says, Oh my God, what's wrong with this child? What am I to do? The other one is quenching the Spirit. Quenching sounds good, certainly because it is relieving thirst. Eh? But quenching in this, in this way is really about suppressing. So you throw water on, not to relieve the thirst, but to Put it out. When you quench the spirit, you stifle the spirit's ability to live and do in your life because I don't want that. 
because the spirit might just embarrass you, you know, because he might just cause you to act in ways that are outside of you. And we don't want that to happen, do we? Everybody has to be true to themselves. Well, you know what I mean. True to our sinful natures, that's really what it is. Be careful, we can quench the spirit of God in our lives. So the spirit of God, in order to bring us back from grieving and quenching, convicts. Have you ever really felt like nobody's there but somebody's wagging a finger at you and saying, there, and pointing out an area of your life that needs some fixing? Thank God for that voice. If you haven't been getting that voice in you, start praying. Because maybe something is wrong. Maybe you have quenched long enough and grieved long enough that he's just kind of like, well, I'm not saying anything because she doesn't listen anyway. But the Holy Spirit has a way of, of just nudging us in directions, <coughs> pointing out to us areas that could make our lives better. So, I know we're pretty long this morning, but since you're still awake at this point, let's finish. Ask you three questions. First one, how submitted to the Holy Spirit are you? In other words, how yielded? How, how much of a sway do you allow God's Spirit in your life? Or do you say, God, you have access to here, but not over here. You can tell me what to do with this, but don't tell me what to do with that. And in our Christian lives, we do that. There's something that our God business and something that are not God's business in our lives. You know what I'm talking about? Well, I don't know what yours is. But for some people, God can tell me about salvation. Yeah, I'd love to know about that because I'd like to be saved. But God doesn't tell me how to live, how to be a parent, how to, uh, to live with my parents, how to deal with my money, how to make decisions about my career. God doesn't have any right to tell me about uh, a spouse or a lover or something because he don't live here and he don't know what I feel and know. But God's spirit, if God's spirit is to be indwelling us, must have complete control. I alluded to it in the first week when I talk about the idea of God's spirit being resident in our lives. And God's spirit being president of our lives. He lives in us. But God is only going to take access to places. He's a good house guest. He'll only take access to places that you allow him. If you have not allowed him to come into this room and the door is closed, you know what God is going to do? He might knock. He might ask you a question or two. But he knows not to push himself into that area. But in submission to him, all the areas of our lives should become open. So that's the first question. Second question, how might your actions and attitudes be grieving the Spirit of God? That one you'll talk about to yourself afterwards. What about the last one? How might your actions and attitude be quenching the Spirit of God? So I'll leave you with those things. What a way to go to the Lord's table. For God has a way of really, really hammering home the point with us. I want to be with you. I want to share with you deeply. And that's why he gave us this meal. He gave us a meal in which we can not only fellowship with each other, but fellowship with him. Let us come together. Come to the Lord's table. Let us pray. Spirit of God, descend upon our hearts. Wean it from earth through all its pulses move. Stoop to our weakness, mighty as thou art, and help us love thee as we ought to love. So Lord, we pray that as we join together around your table, you might meet with us and remind us of your desire to be with us and among us Christ's sake. In Christ alone.